In the book of Mark chapter 2, we begin reading, And Jesus entered again into Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. When Jesus is in the house, people will hear about it. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And Jesus preached the word to them. A couple things. He was in the house. People heard it. They flooded the house. They couldn't get in because the crowd was so large. And what Jesus did was preached. Preaching is God's plan. It's his will. And I know it's foolishness, the Bible says. It's silliness for a man to grab a microphone like I am and just preach to you. I know people don't want to be preached to today. One time I asked, why don't people come to church? And, they, and, and they, I was surprised they said they don't want to be preached to. Well, if you come to the lighthouse, you're going to be preached to because I'm a preacher. I'm, that's what I am. That's what I am. That's one of the top two or three things I do best. Then they came to him. Now, notice verse 3. I want to point out the word they. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could no longer enter the room, the house, because, because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he, roof, 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 I asked, the guy had a talking dog, and the dog said, the man said, if you pay me $10, I'll have this dog talk to you. So he said to the dog, tell the man what's on my house. And he said, roof. He says, tell, tell the man my wife's name. He said, roof. Yeah, he said, my wife's name's Ruth. Ruth. He said, tell the, the greatest baseball player of all time. He said, roof. He said, yeah, babe, roof. The man said, that's the biggest fraud I ever heard. Walked away, and the dog looked up to the master and said, maybe I should have said DiMaggio. <laughs> so on the roof, these men went. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Verse 11, I say to you, take up your bed and go to your house. And immediately he rose up, took up his bed, and went out of the presence of them all. They were amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Today is Team Lighthouse Day. I'm going to be preaching on the healing power of teamwork. Woo. The healing power of teamwork. Shout with all your might, I am on the team. One more time, lift your hands to the Lord. Now, God, I pray for a surge of your power, an impartation of your word. And, Father, I thank you that today your word is going to come alive. It will be the rhema, life-giving, life-breathing word of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to find residence in the hearts of your people. And people are going to take up the mantle, take up the challenge, and they are going to do great things going forward. God, we thank you for what this church has done in the past, but our greatest days lay just in front of us. And God, we thank you for a day of healing and a day of breakthrough and a day of teamwork in this house. And to give the Lord the praise, everybody shout unto him with all your heart. Hallelujah, Lord. And we give you praise. You know, when I, as you're seated, when I started praying about what to bring on Team Lighthouse Day to you, uh, it's interesting, the Lord spoke to my heart this word healing. And I began to contemplate, Lord, there's a lot of ways I could go about building a team here. I love the title that I preached a long time ago called Off the Bleachers and Into the Game. And the Lord said, no, you need to understand that when I put a team together, the end results are always somebody is getting healed. Did you hear me? Now, we are in a land, as Kathy mentioned, that we are desperately, we are so desperate deeply in need of a supernatural healing. Your town, our town, our community, our states need a healing. We need that which is sick, that which is not whole, that which is in pain, 
that which is broken. We need that which is not what God has called it to be to receive a healing from the hand of God. But every time I've looked in a God's word where there were healings, it always surrounds a group of people. We know that Jesus is the healer. But we also, if we're not careful, underestimate the role that a team has in healing. Come on now. This is one of the greatest examples that I can find in God's Word where a team made a direct impact on somebody's life. Come on, church. And in this word, healing, God showed me the banners, a theme that we've adopted many years that Kathy just spoke about and we prayed over. And I started thinking about how this relates to loving God connecting people, reaching our world, there's a common thread in all three of those charges, and that word is healing. You know, when Jesus started his miracles, when he started his wonderful ministry, he built a team around him, and he empowered the team. And he says, I give you power. I give you authority. You are to go and lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You ought to cast out devils, and people will be free. You ought to open the blind eyes. You ought to raise them off their deathbeds. You ought to speak life into those folks that are dying. Jesus put a great premium on teamwork. Come on, church. He says over in Matthew 10 and uh, 10 and 7, he, and he gave these folks power. He says in Mark 3, and I, he appointed 12 to be with, with him, and he gave them power to preach and power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. We are serving a God who has always been a one who understands and has developed and has instituted the power of the team. Adam was not left alone in the garden very long before he built a team with him. It wasn't good that man would be alone. I'll make for him a helpmate, a teammate. Come on, somebody. And as I look at these three wonderful charges and challenges for Lighthouse, I want to tell you why we love God. It's all about healing. Think about this. We love God because he has healed us from the disease of sin, and we love him for it. We love God because we're not sinners anymore. We, you, if you think you initiated it, you're wrong. You love him because he first loved you. He reached out to you before you reached out to him. He called out your name before you called out his name. He came running after you before you went running after him. He pursued after you before you pursued after him. And we love him because he loves us. He commends his love toward us, Romans 5 and 8, while we are yet sinners. Christ died for us. We love him because he has healed us from the greatest disease of all time, the disease of sin. We're no longer ravaged with the symptoms of sin. We have been set free. We are justified, healed, sanctified, and redeemed, and we love him for that. Well, what's my motivation for worship? Your motivation for worship? Your motivation for worship? You need me to tell you why you ought to be motivated to clap and shout and lift your hands and dance before the Lord? Well, I'll tell you. You should already ought to know it, but I'll tell you. Your motivation for worship is that you're not going to hell because of what Jesus has done for you. And if that don't get you fired up, I got nothing for you. I got no pep talk. I got no cute speech. I got no three points. I got nothing for you. If you can't think that the cross rescued you from eternity in a godless pit and now you're going to heaven, if that's not enough to get you excited about Jesus, I got nothing for you. We love him and we worship him and we serve him because of healing. He healed us from the disease of sin. Woo! Ah! And then we connect with people because he healed us from the sickness of selfishness. It's not about us. When I get saved, I want to get other people in my life and tell them about this priceless gift called eternal life. 
I want to be a witness. I want to have other friends. And as Kathy mentioned, our children need to connect and they need to interact with and they need to attach themselves to other believers. Hallelujah. Because it's hard for you to do this by yourself. One shouldn't go alone. You need to have somebody with you in this life. Hallelujah. You send your kids to school, say it's going to take you a while, but you establish the other people, the other kids in your class, your classmates that love Jesus, and they go to church, and you begin to sit at them with, for lunch with them, and you begin to develop a friendship with them, and you can have a Bible study. Come on. Your kids can have a Bible study in their public school. You didn't hear me. If they can have an LGTB club, you can have a Jesus club. Or right, that's discrimination. And Americans don't practice discrimination, do we? Do we? You can have a Jesus club, you can have a Jesus rally, and you can let people know I'm not ashamed of the gospel. If they can take their coffee break and talk about their smut, their porn, their filth, their sordid affairs, you can take a coffee break and open up God's word, and you can talk about Jesus. We don't discriminate, do we? Uh, I said, uh. So we, we love God because he healed us of a disease of sin. We love God because he set us free and we connect with people because we're not selfish. Listen, it's not enough for me to know I got a fire escape and I'm going to heaven and to hell with everybody else. That's not God's plan. As God's people, we are our brother's keepers. We care about others. We reach, we reach out. We do the best we can. We witness and we grow and we give and we care and we go. Gospel begins with go. God begins with go. Good begins with go. If we're going to be people of God, we've got to go. Hallelujah. And connect with people. And we reach our world because he has healed us from the disease of complacency. It's not enough. Amos 6.1 says, Woe well, unto them who are at ease in Zion to sit back and know today around this world there are thousands of people who will face judgment and they will be condemned and they will be damned forever. They will take their last breath on this earth and they will enter a place of torment. And we've got to care about that. And we've got to be concerned about that. And we've got to give the missions and reach missions and be a part of missions. And we've got to be a part of what God is doing both in Jerusalem and all over the world. We've got to care about Richmond and, and New Paris and Wayne County and Preble County and Dark County and Union County and Randolph County. Certainly we have to care about all those folks in Indiana. But there are people around this world that if this gospel will be hit, it's a hit from those who are lost. And if they are lost in their ignorance, they will not find heaven to be their eternal home we've got to believe that uh-huh and so healing is all about this you know in this text today this man's life was changed because of the power of teamwork he he his life was not changed necessarily because he did a lot you know what he did he laid on his cot that's what he did but because people cared enough about him they didn't get anything out of it. Think about that. They, had, they were already walking. They didn't have a lame man's bed. They were healed. They were whole. They were healthy. They were strong. They were able-bodied. They were employed. Uh, they had families that, they, that they depended on them. They were citizens of their community. Um, they, these were four strong, able-bodied, powerful men. And what they had in common was that there was a guy in the middle of them on a mat that could not walk, and they took his problem personally. Hallelujah. It wasn't enough to go around saying, isn't that a shame? That's a terrible thing about old Bobby right there. Oh, I feel bad about him. I wish somebody, I, I heard Jesus was in the house. I just wish somebody would take him. No, they rolled up their sleeves. People say, well, could, could we write the Coca-Cola company and have them help us here at Lighthouse? Coca-Cola ain't going to help us. Could we write, could we, could we write, uh, give me some other company that's not, uh, uh, help me. Uh, the Lily Company, could we write McDonald's Corporation? 
and, and say, hey, you know, you got millions and millions and millions of dollars. Send a little bit over here to Lighthouse. They're not going to help us. If Lighthouse is going to grow, if Lighthouse is going to impact our community, if we're going to see lives change, it won't be somebody else's duty. It falls on us. Look, there are some businesses around Richmond. If they thrive, it won't be because I'm helping them. There are some businesses that they better build their old clientele because I'm not going to be a client. If they're going to be in the black and not the red, if they're going to keep the lights on, it won't be because Pastor Ralph Holdman gave them a dime of his business. I don't care about them. I really don't. I, <laughs> honestly, we were driving yesterday, and, and my son, you know, when you know, kids begin to read, they start reading every sign. So we had Zach, we had a, a birthday party for um, somebody yesterday, and all the kids come over, and we're coming by the church over here and turning, and Grant said, Papa's, Papa Joe's. Papa Joe's. He said, that place is called Papa Joe's. And I thought, I can't, I love for Papa Joe's to sell liquor for the last day. Are you now you up there talking hateful about distribution of alcohol? You better believe I'm talking hateful about it. I don't like those guys. Well, that's pretty personal. Let me tell you something. Jesus takes everything personal. And if those folks, listen to, my, listen to me, if those folks are going to thrive in business, they're going to do it without my help. But when it comes to your church, I've seen people have the same attitude. They want to come to church. They want a comfortable setting. They want great ministry. They want an awesome thing. They want a nice, wonderful experience. Um, but they want somebody else to pony up. Oh, I know you all, I know you all just wanted to jump to your feet and cheer me on right there. Take your time. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's different. It's different. It, it, this, the church, you are the church. You, you are the people responsible to be a part of the team. And when you are on the team, you take ownership. And when you are on the team, you take it personal. And when you are on the team, it belongs to you. I said it's called responsibility. If everyone took responsibility over the lighthouse like you took it, what great church or what lack of church would we have? And I'm challenging you today. This is Coach talking to the team. I'm encouraging you to step up today. It's called Step Up Day. Hallelujah. And where there is a team, there is something significant that happens. I want you to write down T-E-A-M. And I'm going to delve into this account for a moment. Because I want to tell you, we need everybody doing their part. Shout everybody. Now listen to me. As you write down the first letter, T, in every sports team, there's a designated amount of players to be on the field at the given time. So I'm going to give you test your knowledge. How many basketball players on one team on the floor? How many football players? How many baseball players? How many didn't know any of that? And all of you who didn't know it, you know why you don't know it? Because you don't care about it. You could ask me a question about what happened on Days of Life this week, too, and I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know who slept with who, who slapped who, who shot who, on what, your favorite soap opera? I wouldn't know. You know why? You know why? Because you don't know the number of the team, uh, the players, because you don't care about that. You only invest your knowledge in something that's of value to you. Huh? Come on. People come up and say, did you hear what happened to that church? Or no, I, I'm not going to, I don't gossip. I'm not involved in that. I love them, but I'm not involved. I don't hear. I don't, I don't have my, I, I'm not in that. I don't do that. Let me tell you something. I got another one for you. Hockey. How many players on the ice for a hockey team? Six. Five, counting one, counting the goalie is six. But here's what I want to bring up about hockey. I've preached 
1,565 million sermons. First time I ever mentioned hockey. Obviously, you've missed it because nobody knows anything about hockey much. There's this little puck, there's a stick, and they run around and punch each other. I was at a fight and a hockey game broke out. Come on. But here's the thing. The hockey is the best sport to tell you what I want to put into your spirit because it is a game that they've actually let them play what's called shorthanded. If a guy gets a penalty in football, he's ejected, but someone comes in and takes his place. If a guy fouls out in basketball, he, is, he has to go sit on the bench, but someone else gets to check in and take his place. If a baseball player runs in the wall and has a concussion, and now they have a, a no place in the right field, they don't play the whole game without a right fielder. They put someone else in at right field. In hockey, when there is a penalty, they put that man in the penalty box, and he's not substituted in for he is not replaced, and they call it shorthanded. And when a team with six is playing a team with five, when you have both goalies on the ends and you have four against five, that's called an advantage. And so they look at the clock. He may have 20 minutes or 10 minutes in the penalty box, and as soon as that clock runs out, he gets to come back in. But it's in those moments it's easiest to score. Now watch this. The devil wants to keep the church playing shorthanded. Because when we play shorthanded, when you don't show up to do your role, when you don't participate and do the part God called you to do, we are playing shorthanded and we are outnumbered and outmatched by the adversary. Is that good preaching on somebody's birthday? Come on. We've been playing shorthanded in the church long enough. We need everybody to answer the call, everybody to step in. We need the next person in to be the next person in, and we need people to fill their jobs and fill their ministry and take it personal, and, and everyone must do their part. Now, listen to me. I'm sure that day on that cot, when those four guys approached that man and said, we got a plan, he's looking up there, laying and saying, you got a what? They go, we got a plan here. We got a plan. Uh, we heard there's a healer in, the, in Capernaum, and he's in his house, and he's preaching, and everybody that he touches and everybody he uh, talks to is healed, and we're going to take him to you. He says, you're going to do what? Do you know there are people that just need us to come to them and says, there's a place called White House Assembly of God on 2339 West Carroll, Richmond, Indiana. If you get there, you'll be better. I got to write on three S's and one amen. So I'll give you a chance. That wasn't the first time this morning you aggravated me. But I said, there ought to be something in you that says, if I can get you there, if you can come with me, I'll get you there. I'll get you there. And the one who's in there, the one who's in there walking around, he'll make you better. You don't have to leave like you came. Come on now. Lighthouse is called to be a place of healing. I'm talking about all four. Don't let me forget. So last Sunday night in prayer, God birthed a burden in me to pray for everyone with diabetes. And it was a large group of people in our church that's either fighting with diabetes, they are pre-diabetes, or it's in their family, and they're concerned about it. Now, I don't know why the Lord, he dealt with me about that. We wasn't home. We wasn't home five minutes till my good friend, Pastor Brent Oliver, uh, had an evangelist there Sunday over, up in by Lafayette named Joe Olden. And Brent put on his Facebook, you won't, I got to tell you what happened in our church tonight. There was a man who's brittle diabetic and his feet has hurt him so bad for the past 15 years. Now, I want you to think about this. Over here, I, we are praying against diabetes. Up there, two and a half hours, they're praying against diabetes. And pastor said, that man who couldn't walk for the thriving, horrible, throbbing pain in his feet took off his shoes 
and ran four laps around my church tonight, completely healed, completely set free, completely delivered of diabetes. Come on. And you know diabetes don't go easy. You know it don't play. But it had to get under the authority of Jesus because Jesus was in the house. I want, I want for the glory of God, not for my, not for my glory, not for the sake of Lighthouse, but for the glory of his great name that others be drawn to him. I want a testimony that said someone walked in and they were completely annihilated and eaten up with pain and sickness and symptoms have ravaged their body year after year after year. And they went to the doctor, and the doctor did the best they could, but nobody could make them better. But we found that Jesus was in the house, and we got him in the house where Jesus was, and Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, and they were healed. Because there's healing in the house if Jesus is there, because he is the healer. Healing, 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 healing. Listen to me. I'm going to make this very clear. When we don't do our part, somebody is not being healed. So you got four guys, and they had this bright, bright idea. But when they get there, the obstacle presents themselves as something they didn't count on. I mean, they didn't know that it was so crowded inside that people came on the outside. And when they got there, they couldn't even see a window. They couldn't see a door. There was no way getting in. Now, what if one of them would have said, well, you know, I gave my best. I tried. Come on. In the offering today, some of you tried. I did my best. I know it wasn't what I was supposed to do, but I tried. Well, what if he had said, you know what, guys? I tried. And, you know, after all, we did our best. Another guy said, well, hey, come think of it. I got some mowing to do this afternoon. And now, all of a sudden, instead of four corners of that man's mat, there's two. And when they get there, with two guys on a corner, how many know every bed has four corners? Now, I know how you can figure that out. Someday, go make your bed. I know that, listen, listen, I know you believe in the supernatural, but if you didn't make your bed this morning, the Holy Ghost didn't walk in and make it for you. It's going to be sloppy when you get home. And all the hairs in the sink. I know one thing about our sink. I'm just saying. (laughs) Now listen, it took, watch this, all four pulling their weight. Hockey needs six. Baseball needs nine, football needs 11, and basketball needs five. And I can promise you that if you're going to get a hold of somebody's bed and take off the roof and lower them down, you got a number. You need four. Now watch this. Just as that man needed four, Lighthouse Assembly of God needs 1,000 people to do the work in Richmond we're supposed to do. For us to begin to maximize our potential, God didn't call us to build this building 10 years ago, this this size, so we can have it half full or 60% full. He put it on our hearts. He opened the doors. He made the way. He, He carved out the mountain. He carved out the path. He brought it all to pass, and he made it into reality because he has an expectation for a lighthouse. And when we are not meeting our expectation, when we get tired, when we get weary, when we say we've tried, I've done our best, I've got other things to do, somebody is not being healed that God wants to heal. You just think you're sitting home resting. No, it's costing somebody a healing. Because I'm talking about the healing power of teamwork. And so I'm going to get you these, these four real quick. Did I tell you right down T yet? A long time ago, but... I'm preaching so good, I don't even care when I said it. I said, I was preaching so good. T, triumphant tenacity. That's what that means to me. 
And when the Bible says when they could not get in because of the crowd, they got tenacious. And they said, you know what? We didn't come here to lose. We come here for some triumph. You put a little try with some ump, and you get triumph. We come in for some victory, and we are not, watch this, we are not taking no for an answer. You better be glad he was relentless coming after you. We need to get relentless once again to see the church be the church he's called us to be. It was tenacity. The bottom line is, they got what they want. They wanted to win, and they won. E, effective excellence. They were effective, uh-huh, because it says in verse 4, and, and the guys broke through. I mean, they went up to that roof, and they didn't get there and find it too difficult. They said, oh, man, whoever built this house, it must have been a Robbie Johnson team. It, the, this roof ain't coming off. I mean, it's got 5,996 nails. I mean, there were some pros put this roof on. I thought it was just some pastor pretending to be a carpenter. <laughs> oh, that's so funny if you knew what I'm talking about. Every time I try to be a carpenter, I'm glad I'm a pastor. I mean, I bust myself, I cut myself, I shoot nails through my fingers, I get beat up like, oh, my goodness, and then it still isn't done right. Uh, but they get up there and say, man, the pros built this roof. I mean, I'm telling you, there, there's no getting the roof off. And they could have said to the guy, then, look, look, I hope you appreciate what we've done here. And the guy, I'm sure he's thinking, yeah, but you jokers told me I'd get healed, and I'm still on the mat. You came to me, fool. And what you said was advertised is in the house, and we're going to give up now. You've already drugged me up this crazy roof. Everybody's jeering. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's calling us names. And here I am laying on this roof. And now you're telling me you can't break through? And the Bible says that they were effective. They went up to the roof to tear it off, and tear, tearing it off is what they did. They tore off the roof. We're healed, here to build a great church, and I want him to say to us, well done. You are a part of a great church. You are a part of a great team. Enter in, and you did what you were supposed to do. You were excellent in what I gave you to do. Give the Lord a mighty shout. Pastor Josh has passed this out, and I want just to show it to you. I have this. It says, excellence honors God, and it inspires others. Is anybody getting inspired today by being here? Let me tell you something. When this praise team goes up there and hits that note, they're giving it excellence. They're doing the best they can. We got, a, we got a young pastor out there. He has worked. He got off a plane all day yesterday after visiting family down in Texas. And he stayed here into the hours of the night building a nice fall festival for our kids, a Halloween alternative, because we don't participate in a devil's holiday. And this, don't you, listen, I'm just challenging you. Get the kids here for a movie night. You don't, you don't, you don't, you can have, they can have a lot of fun with Jesus, more fun than they'll have with people calling them all kinds of goblins and ghosts and witches and all that garbage that is of the devil's team. We got a youth pastor, we got a pastor right here, the beautiful pastor's wife, we got deacons, we got team people, we got folks, you all are doing your best. Let me tell you something, when we give excellence, when we do our best, when we don't get slipshod with it, when we don't do lackadaisical work, when we give it our very best, when we, when we say to God, I'm laying it all out on the line for you today. I woke up early this morning and said, God, when I preach, may they see a man on fire today. May they see somebody consumed with the zeal of God and able to impart the word of God. May I make an impact with the word today. May I do it with excellence today because the excellent honors you and it inspires others. A, affirming appreciation. Woo! And when they got down 
into the place where Jesus was, Jesus appreciated it. And he said, you guys here. He said, you know, I've been in this house for a long time preaching, and I saw the crowd growing. But you guys threw me for a little loop when the dust started coming down on my head. Uh, and then a crack here, a pop there, and all the noise. I kept preaching, but you guys didn't know what it did to my spirit. When all of a sudden a hole opened up in the house, and I saw four gruffy, strong, powerful men look down, cleared away the debris, and then started lowering a sick man who could not walk on his lame bed into my presence. I leaped within myself. And then <laughs> he turned to the men up in the hole on the roof. And he didn't say to the Healy that he was going to heal. He said to the team that was getting him healed, you guys, your faith, that team up there, you, your faith has touched me. Your faith has made this man whole. If they got tired, if they got weary, if they phoned it in, if they got too busy, if they didn't do their part, if they didn't fulfill their role, that man would have came on his bed and he would have left on his bed. But there's healing power in teamwork. M. Measurable movement. You see... A lot in the kingdom of God is kind of intangible. Well, we had a good service. Well, well, well okay, well, well, how would you have a good service? Well, the spirit moved. What's that mean? I don't know. I felt something. Well, what did you feel? I don't know. But God's presence was really there. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, how, how, how did you know? I don't know. I just knew. And in, 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 in the kingdom, think about that. Uh, things like love and joy and all of these things, when Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit, he brought in the analogy of the wind blowing where it lists. He had to bring it into our world. Let me tell you something. So much is just kind of floating out there. It's intangible. You can't grab a hold of it. But when there is a team doing their part, you can visibly see the difference. So all of you bring one person back next week. Well, we have a great service yet, but it won't be because we just had all these feelings. We will visibly measure the movement of what's happening. Come on, church. In a moment, I'm going to take my two-foot yellow level woo, and my brand-new Sharpie marker. Mm -hmm. I got two for the price of one because we got so many goals to scratch off, we're going to run out of ink with one. In a few years, they're all going to be scratched off. I'm claiming that in Jesus' name. But goals, listen to me, goals are one way to measure movement. Goals are one way to measure growth. I got two questions for you. Are you on the team? Who decides if you're on the team? I'm going to tell you, the devil doesn't decide it. Where are you guys going? We're going out there? Okay. Okay. Meet me out there. You're following me. Excellent. And Jesus doesn't decide if you're on the team. I don't decide if you're on the team. 
Who says if you're on the team or not? Now, every coach in every locker room yesterday and today, they're going to say something like this. For us to win today, team, everybody needs to do their job. Not everybody's a quarterback, but whatever your role is, if your job is to fill the cups, if your job is to fold the towels, if your job is to make the popcorn, everybody must do their job. If somebody lets down, it won't be an excellent product. Everybody must fill their role. Then they don't stop there. And they say, today, if we're going to win, not only must everybody do their job, but everybody must step up. Thus the paper I placed in your hands. Pull it out and look at it. This is not an all-conclusive list, but I want everybody to get a pen out. And today, listen, it's not okay for three out of four men to tear the roof off and lower that man. I know some of you, I love you with all my heart, but some of you, are you just content to let everybody else be a part of the team? And it's okay with you. That, that day has to end. Could I get a strong amen? Could I get an even stronger amen? It is not okay for someone else to do the work of the ministry and you do nothing. That can't, that can't be something you feel good about. If you feel good about that, you're made of different cloth than me. Because when I'm on a team, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my part. I may not be the star, and that's fine, but I, you can count on me. I was always a lineman. I never, I played football eight years of my life, and I never one time made a touchdown. But I helped a lot of other guys make them, and I stopped a lot of other guys from making them. And I felt just as good as if I won the Heisman Trophy because I know I did my part. I was on the team. And the lineman coach always said this. He said, you offensive lineman, remember, you're a team. And just like a a chain, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. You got two tackles, you got two guards, you got a center, you got a tight end. All the opponent needs to do is find one that doesn't block, and that's where they're coming through. We got to sure up the line, and we got to fill in the holes, and we got to step up. We got to step up. Church Jesus is coming soon. We've been playing shorthanded long enough. Whoo! If I wasn't saved, I'd be getting saved right now. I'm telling you. There's an anointing here. My God, I feel something going off. Now listen to me. There's going to be a shift. October 25th, there's going to be a shift. And here's what it's going to take. Everybody sign your name on the bottom. Put your name on the bottom. And I want you to look at that list real quick. And I want you to think about what area you're not doing. You're not checking the areas you're doing. You're filling, up, you're filling in the areas you're not doing, but you're willing to start doing. Now, there's a place on the bottom for you to write the word, and I want to deal with something. I want to deal with something. Can you all let me deal with one thing and still love me? Okay, I got six that are still going to love me. Let's start all over. Front, back, side, balcony. I said... Can I deal with one thing and you all still love me? Lord, there are going to be a few, a few hate me today, but I have to do it, won't I? I don't want to. Okay, okay, Lord, your will, not mine, but your will be done. Outpouring. This Friday will be close to our 25th outpouring service since last fall. There are people in this church have not come to one yet. And do you know why you haven't come to one yet? Because you haven't come to one yet. But I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody has just come to one because they got to come back. Because Jesus, the healer, is in the house and he is touching people in a significant way. 
Now, I love you, but this is Team Lighthouse Day, is it not? Listen to me. Whatever you've been doing those past 25 nights, on Friday nights, you couldn't remember if I gave you a million dollars. You couldn't recall. You couldn't know. But I promise you there have been people here, and I'm one of them, that have been these outpouring services. I could tell you where I was at the altar. I could tell you who was preaching. I could tell you the song that was being sung. I could tell you how long God laid me out on this floor and what he spoke to me. It wasn't just an average Friday night where I wasted time like I did the Friday night before. And we have outpouring this Friday night, and it's time somebody steps up. And you know what you could do? You could put, I'm going to step up and letting everybody know how much I love my pastor preaching the truth. So when he says something like that he just said, I'm going to clap and shout. I know that you can write all, all that on the back. Pastor. I'm sorry. Outpouring. We are going to be an outpouring church. I got no plans. Jesus has not told me to ever again not have Friday night services, at least several every year. I love you all, but it's time to step up. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to check off everything. Wednesday nights is huge. Can I, tell you, can I tell you a true story? Somebody said to me, oh, this is a few years ago. They're a member of the church. They're a member of the church. Nice person. I mean, nice person. Nice, great. And they said to me, man, I drove by the church the other night, and there's a whole crowd of people at the church. There's cars all over the place. What was going on? What was going on? I said, well, what day was it? He's a, they said, I think it was a Wednesday. Now, how many know if you was the coach or the pastor, you wouldn't be feeling real good right there? And I said, you wonderful asset, you. You, uh, well, we have church on Wednesday nights. We do? No, we don't. We do. There's a mouse in your pocket because you don't. <laughs> Listen. It's time. I'm going to get myself in so much trouble. I better shut up. So. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to multitask these good, these good-looking men. Um, Lisa, can we throw that uh, up there real quick? Is, is all 20 up there at uh, one time or just a few? Talk to me. The vid 2020 vision. How many can we? They're all at once? Okay. I'm going to tell you. Let's just look at them real quick. This is 2020 vision. This is what we want to look like. And just when I point, turn. Go to the next one. Oh, go, go. Go, 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 stop. Watch this. I believe what I'm most excited about is that you are hungry for Jesus. And can you honestly know that a year ago when we set out these visions, goals, that can you honestly say to me there has been an increase for hunger of God's presence at Lighthouse? Can you shout about that, somebody? I mean, there's been an increase. Now, I learned a long time ago to love people when they come. So if you can come on Sunday morning, I love you, but give it your best when you're here. Come on now. And worship God with all your heart. You know your schedule. How many know I don't get mad at you, don't chew you out? Well, there's a couple I've chewed out, but not you. Um, but the point is, the point is, we got to be hungry for the Lord. That one, now these, when we scratch these off, what, we, what we're saying is this goal is accomplished and being accomplished. We're not going to ever be a church with not hungry again, okay? Number eight, go. Number nine, go. These are, we're still working on all these. Number nine, 
we have launched into a marriage ministry, and the leaders, Dwayne and Jamie Harrison, have told me that so much of that is being accomplished that can be scratched off, and we give God praise about that. Can you shout amen? amen. Now, now, I've also, in addition to my Sharpie, I got some sparkly stars because there is going to be three we scratch off, and there's going to be three we asterisk because we're really close to scratching them off, and 10 is one of them. Lighthouse Worship Ministry being marketed. We have songs on iTunes. Um, um, Skylab. Photo bombs. And Selfie World. We have songs in all those. Speaking of selfies, how many have never taken a selfie? Look at the look at all the hands being raised. You know, you know, those, you know what that means. We haven't taken one. I'm not going to be cute. I got to go. I I have so much cuteness rolling up in me. Comprehensive assimilation plan, college age internship plan. All of these have gotten attention, but they're not close to being uh, going yet. Expanded bus ministry, that's just a matter of money. That's all that takes. Somebody ought to just step up and bring in six or $7,000 and buy us, a couple, buy us a new bus. It won't be new, but it'll be better than a lot of them we got out there. It'll make it to point A to point B without 911 being called. Come on. Because I'll be honest with you, some of our buses need to be lit on fire and shoved down the deepest hill. Number 14, kids' ministry center enha uh, enhancements. Uh, from new roof to new kitchen design to all of the things that have been done. Pastor Josh got all new uh, TVs for all the kids out there and their games, all that stuff. 15's a big ticket item. Try buying a high-end playground once. It's more than about 12 or 15 of us paid for our houses combined. Number 16, did you notice the first-time guest station out there? Pastor Josh, designed, Pastor Josh designed that, and that's in the house. It's being scratched off. And number 17 is being starred because we have all new flat screen TVs and, um, and uh, just a few other projects to go on that. But significant progress. Missions giving to, is, is still in the works. 100% tithers still in the works. And dead free, can you, can you imagine the dance we'll do when we scratch that one off? So, don't nobody leave but me and the cameraman. We're going to do some we're going to do some goal scratching off. You'll see it on the screens. I'm trying to We got the tortoise and the hare here. Okay, well I'm doing this. Can you can you fill that blank out, uh, on a blank out on one of your cards? Come on. Ooh, all right. Okay, here we go. Here we, here we go. I'm going to put a star on number 10. When I do this, shout amen and give the Lord a praise. Can you hear me in there? Can they hear me? I'm going to put a star on number 17 give the lord a shout i'm going to put a star on number 14 give the lord a praise uh, and then i'm going to scratch off number eight give the lord uh, number seven yay oh hallelujah bear with me i'm getting older Number nine. 
Number 16. Give the Lord a mighty shout. Hallelujah. So, I want you to stand with me. And here's what we're going to do. I want to just deposit this in your heart. Because the devil's trying to get some of you to underestimate your role. Listen to me. Do you know what it meant to Jesus today for you to just show up? Our service, are you all still listening, is better because you're here. But you don't know that because you've never not been here when you wasn't here. Right? Dale doesn't know what a service is like when Dale's not here if he's not here. I have seen, and my wife and I have talked, when one or two people that typically don't come to something start coming, just, they just start saying, I haven't been doing that, but now I'm going to. The whole thing lifts. Do you know that some of you... If you could come pray with us tonight and you haven't been, I'm not going to come to you. I promise you and say, you should have been here sooner. I'm just going to hug your neck and say, good to see you. Some of you haven't been to Sunday school, that, and you come next Sunday morning. Some of you that haven't been Wednesday nights, you come next Wednesday night. Some of you haven't ever been to Outpouring or haven't been for a while, you come this Friday night. Just by your presence, you are on the team. We need every number in place to do their part. And the bottom line is, if you don't, somebody who God wanted to heal is not getting healed. Are you receiving this word? Now I need everybody to wave this to me. I'm looking for the non-wavers. Wave it loud. If you didn't get one, we'll get you one. Who doesn't have one? All right. Uh, raise your hand. We'll get you one. Um, not... Um, Tanya, who has them? Uh, the deans, Ron and, and Leah didn't get one, and I know they'd like to wave. Now, just listen to the sound right here. Everybody wave it. Who's getting real nervous right now? Who's getting real nervous right now? Because he's seen a church that's already done great things about to step up. And he's in for a, a hurt. Shoo. All right, let's come, and we're going to stand around the altar. Everybody come, lay them on the altar, and this, let's just lift our hands and praise the Lord. Let's lift our hands and praise the Lord. Let's just come and worship Jesus.